I'm here with all of our furry friends. This is Lachlan the Llama, Clyde the Cow, Finn the Fish, Nigel the Giraffe, Cleo the Chicken, Babette the Bunny, and Sheldon the Turtle. And our furry friends help us remember our classroom rules when we're all together. But way more important, they help us learn Bible stories and they help teach us about God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit. So they're gonna hang out with me today while we talk about Philippians. Now remember, Philippians is a book in our Bible, but it's also a letter that Paul wrote to his friends. And Paul had some really important stuff to share with them in his letter. Last week, we learned about joy. And joy's different than just being happy, right? Joy's so much bigger and it's so much deeper because Joy comes from being filled up with Jesus' love. And joy can last through anything because it's not about what's happening around us. It's about Jesus. In Philippians, Paul tells us that to have joy, we need to have the right attitude. Hmm. What's our attitude? Have mom and dad ever told you to change your attitude? Well, our attitude is how we feel about things and how we think about things. And our attitude affects the way we behave, how we act. See, sometimes when I was little, my mom would tell me I had a sour attitude. Have you ever eaten anything really sour? I'm not talking sour gummy worms. Those are awesome, but something yucky sour. You put it in your mouth and you just want to spit it out. Sometimes that's the way my attitude was. I would walk around and I would be grumpy and no matter what was going on, I could see what was wrong, how it wasn't going to work out. Everything was negative. That's not the right attitude, right? And quite honestly, it's not any fun to be around. Well, Paul, he had a good attitude, but he was in prison. See, prison's scary and lonely and sometimes painful. If Paul was in this icky place, how did he have a good attitude? Well, he chose to have a good attitude by looking not at everything around him that wasn't going so great, but by looking at Jesus. And when he looked at Jesus, Jesus helped him see all the things around him that gave him the chance to tell other people about Jesus. And that gave Paul a good attitude. We can choose to have a good attitude, but is it because I'm so smart? I'm really smart. Or because I'm so cool. I just don't let anything bother me. Or because I'm so good, I'm such a good person, I'll always make the right choice. I mess up all the time, but because of Jesus filling my heart with his love and his joy, he can help me choose to have the right attitude. Hmm, if I need Jesus to change my attitude, what could I do? See, I need Jesus to help me, how could I tell Jesus I need his help? We can pray, right? I can pray and ask Jesus to help me have the right attitude because Jesus tells us that anything we need, anytime we need him, he's there, he's listening, and he'll help us. So if I've got my sour attitude where I look around and I see everything that's going wrong, and grown-ups, this has been a year for that, right? We look around and think, everything's gone wrong. I see a problem everywhere. Or I can look around and see where Jesus is working, where, where he's giving me a chance to tell somebody about him, where there's something really kind I could do for somebody else, where he's doing something really fun just for me. All those things are still happening too. And if I want to choose to have a good attitude, to see things the way Jesus sees them, or choose to have a bad attitude and see all the problems, 
that's my choice. But Jesus promises he'll be there to help me. He'll be there to help me to have the right attitude and to choose to see things his way. And you know what? It's first him, he helps us. I can pray and ask him for help, but he gives me friends to help. See, Paul and the Philippians, they had each other. Paul and the Philippians prayed for each other and they encouraged each other and they were in the work together, doing things with each other, for each other, for Jesus. And Jesus gave me you. See, we are in it together. So we can pray together, we can pray for each other, and we can help each other have a good attitude, but we can also help each other with the work. Now, last week, we had a ball pit at our small group, and it was so much fun. But after a while, there were no balls left in the ball pit, right? They were all over the floor and under the lounge and just everywhere. And we all had a choice to make. We could have a bad attitude. I don't wanna clean up the toys and I didn't make that mess. Somebody else jumped in more than me. Why do I have to do it? Have you ever had that attitude? Or we could have a good attitude. Wasn't it fun that we got to play together? And wasn't it fun that we get to have a ball pit? And now, we have each other to do all the work together. So that's what we did. And everybody pitched in and we all picked up the toys and it was done in no time, but it was so much fun to be able to do that together. So remember Jesus tells us we can ask him for help, right? And he'll help us have a good attitude. He'll remind us of the joy that he's put in, in our hearts. And he gave us each other to pray for each other, to pray with each other, and to help each other. Now, I think Pastor John has more to say on this topic, so let's see what he has to say from the book of Philippians. Hi, everyone. Hey, look, I've got a question for you. Are you more of an optimist or a pessimist? Like I think considering the year that 2020 has been so far, probably a lot more of us would consider ourselves a bit pessimistic than we, we might have in the past. Hey, look, personally, I like to think of myself as a, a hopeful idealist. And then because of the situation and the world at the moment, I'm sort of justified in being a little bit pessimistic, which is, you know, really just basically a fancy way of saying that I'm a cynical pessimist, but I, I don't want you to label me that way. The truth is, I reckon most of us are probably a little bit of both, right? A little bit optimistic, a little bit pessimistic. And it sort of just depends on our circumstances, our context, what's going on. I mean, there are some circumstances in life where it is totally reasonable that you wouldn't be particularly optimistic. I mean, some circumstances almost call for pessimism. I mean, imagine if you're facing death or you're unable to visit and see your friends or family. Or imagine if some people at your work are sort of uh, spreading malicious rumours about you and trying to undermine you and make life hard for you. Or, you know, maybe you've even been arrested on some trumped-up charges for some reason. Now, some of those examples might sound familiar to you. I mean, a lot of us in 2020 have become familiar with the reality of not being able to visit friends or family. Others of those examples might be a bit weird, but look, they're all things that the Apostle Paul is experiencing in our passage in Philippians today. And yet, we'll see that his attitude when faced with these circumstances is consistently an optimistic and positive one. I mean, as we look through the letter of Philippians, we see how the gospel transforms lives. And last week, Ken talked about how in Philippians, we sort of see this consistent tone of joy throughout the entire letter. We're sort of picking up on that idea a bit more today. And we're looking at how transformed lives 
transform our perspective. First of all, we're gonna we're gonna look a little bit at Paul's circumstances, and we'll start off uh, at the beginning of our passages in verses twelve to fourteen, and we see that Paul's been imprisoned; he's been arrested. Now, it's important to note that in the first century Roman world, imprisonment prison is not a punishment. So you're put in prison when you're awaiting trial. So Paul has been arrested, he's been charged, but he hasn't yet been found guilty of anything. Prison is not a punishment. It's not pleasant, but it's not a punishment. See, punishments in the ancient world tended to be a bit more corporal. I mean, you, you might get lucky and just cop a fine or maybe have some property confiscated, but much more likely you're going to be beaten, flogged or killed. Particularly if you're poorer or lower class. I mean, if you're wealthy or powerful, there's a chance that you might be exiled or banished. But for most people, Paul included, the most likely punishment for any crime is going to be a beating or death. Which is why in verse 20 through 26, we see Paul talking about death. He knows that if he ends up being found guilty of whatever he's been accused of, there is a very real chance that the punishment for him will be death. So Paul's in prison, potentially facing death. Which is an unpleasant enough experience as it is. But what's particularly hard for Paul is that he's not even able to visit and see his, his friends his family, the churches that he has planted, his family and the faith. I mean, he wants to. He's a travelling apostle. It's kind of his deal, travelling around the different churches, planting new ones, visiting the old ones, seeing friends and family in the faith. But here we see that he doesn't know when or even if he's ever going to see any of these people again. He doesn't know if he will ever see the people he's writing this letter to again. And on top of all this, we see in verses 15 through 18 that there are some people who are taking Paul's imprisonment as an opportunity to harass and belittle him. In verse 17, he says they're trying to increase the suffering of his imprisonment. So Paul's circumstances aren't great. But let's look at Paul's perspective, his attitude. In relation to his imprisonment, verse 12 and 13, it's actually helped me spread the gospel. The whole imperial guard and everyone else knows that I suffer for Christ. So Paul sees his imprisonment as an opportunity for the gospel to spread. In verse 14, it's helped others spread the gospel. It's the brothers and sisters, the church, has been made confident in my example, Paul says. And then in verses 27 through 30, we see him saying that he knows that his imprisonment is encouraging it have the church to live how they should be, striving together side by side for the gospel. Despite Paul's suffering, despite their own suffering. That's Paul's perspective on his imprisonment. Let's look at Paul's attitude in relation to the possibility of his execution. In verse 19 and 20, I rejoice. I'm not going to be shamed. It doesn't matter if I live or die. Either way, Christ will be proclaimed. And then in verses 21 through 26, we see him saying that even death wouldn't be that bad. I mean, it'd actually be good for me to depart and go to be with Christ. But if I do live, and I'm pretty sure that's what's going to happen, then look, that's good too, because I can continue to spread the gospel and boast in Jesus Christ. And then look at Paul's attitude in relation to those who are increasing his suffering. Yes, they're proclaiming Christ out of envy and rival. Yes, they proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition. Yes, they don't like me. Yes, they're trying to make my life hard, my suffering worse. But hey, at least Jesus Christ is proclaimed, right? So where does this sort of insanely positive attitude and perspective come from? Why is Paul so optimistic? Why is Paul's attitude so relentlessly positive, even in the face of suffering? Well, the answer which he gives again and again is the gospel, the proclamation of Christ. It comes up over and over and over again in this passage. This is what drives Paul's optimism. Again and again, this is what he turns to. Yes, stuff is going bad for me. Yes, I am suffering. But 
the gospel is being proclaimed. Paul, throughout Philippians, never really gives a single precise definition of what the gospel is. He seems to just assume that his readers know what he's talking about, and they probably do know exactly what he means by that phrase. Do I want to take a moment now just to talk about some of the things that I think we do learn about the gospel in this passage? First, is that the gospel is about Christ. I mean, it's sort of used interchangeably with this phrase, proclaim Christ, or the word, throughout this passage. And particularly we see that the gospel is about Jesus' death and resurrection. In verse 13, Paul says that his imprisonment is for Christ. But sort of a more literal reading of this passage would be that his imprisonment is in or with Christ. You see, this is alluding to Jesus' death, but particularly that for the Christian, when they suffer, they suffer in solidarity with Christ's suffering and death. And also with the knowledge of Christ's solidarity with them in their suffering. And in verse 21 and 23, we see that even dying is gain for Paul because he knows he'll go to be with Christ, alluding to Christ's resurrection and Paul's hope in his own resurrection. So first we see that the gospel is about Christ and particularly his death and resurrection. Second, we see that the gospel creates community. It's what bonds the community of believers together. In verse 27, we see Paul saying that he knows that the Philippians are standing firm in one spirit, striving side by side with one mind for the faith of the gospel. And it's why Paul can even say that those who are against him are still part of this community because despite their motives, despite their disagreements, they too proclaim the gospel. They too are one in the faith of Jesus Christ. And this is a reminder for us, I think, that we aren't in this alone. I mean, it's not just about me. It's about us. Even in the face of suffering, there are others who are willing to suffer alongside us who will come alongside us, take us by the arms, hold us steady, support us, and encourage and remind us of the hope for which we live, the hope that a better future is possible. Which leads us to point three. The gospel is an announcement of a different world order. See, in the New Testament, this word gospel often sort of has political overtones. The word gospel, good news, is often used in the ancient world to announce a military or political victory. It's a political statement, which means to talk about the gospel of Jesus Christ is sort of necessarily to compare it with the gospel of Caesar or the gospel of the Roman Empire or whatever it is. But in this chapter, we see almost what sort of looks like the opposite of good news, the opposite of victory. We see imprisonment and potential death. Yet Paul can say, even in my suffering, even in my imprisonment, good news advances. And in fact, even amongst the people you wouldn't expect, the imperial guards, those who are committed to the gospel of Caesar, know that Paul suffers for the gospel of Jesus. What's implied is the power of the gospel to take ground, even when it looks like it's being held back or restricted or defeated. And in fact, this is the reality of the gospel that turns the world upside down. It turns defeat into victory. This is, this is resurrection, even or even particularly in the face of suffering and death. That's where victory is found. And that changes everything. That changes the world. So this gospel is a hope of a better future. Not just after death, but now. It's about transformed lives, and more than that, it's about a transformed world. And this is a hope that can remain strong, even in the face of the suffering of an individual or, or a community. Because even in the suffering, this good news advances. So this is a hope that would totally reconfigure your values and therefore your attitudes. It puts everything in a new perspective. Because it is a hope that can't be held back. 
is inevitable and it will persevere despite suffering in the world. And you know what, in a weird way, this hope doesn't just survive through suffering. Sort of strangely, this hope actually causes suffering in the first place. Let me explain what I mean. When, when Paul talks about suffering in the New Testament, with perhaps only one exception, he's not talking about accidents or natural disasters or war or illness or cancer or violence or poverty or injury or really sort of any of the sorts of things that we would normally connect in our life with the idea of suffering. Paul's talking about physical trials and mental stress and relational discord and, and violence that has come about directly as a result of someone's decision to follow Jesus. So therefore, the suffering Paul is talking about is suffering that could be avoided. You could choose, Paul could choose, to live differently, to not follow Jesus, to not live his life under the hope of the gospel. And the suffering that Paul talks about, the suffering that Paul is experiencing, would disappear. It could be avoided. Let me put it another way. The suffering that Paul is experiencing is Christian suffering alongside or in or with or for Jesus. Now, look, I'm probably the last person in the world to encourage sort of naive optimism. Like, I'm, I'm a realist. Well, I'm a hopeful idealist. Yeah, but the reality is I'm a pessimist. That's just how, how I am. It's how I made it. It's my personality. I'm a pessimistic sort of person, a bit melancholy. But actually, maybe it takes a mixture of pessimism and optimism to truly understand Paul's perspective in this passage. You see, Paul isn't a blind or naive optimist. He knows life can be hard. He knows that things will go wrong. He knows that suffering is inevitable. He knows what the world is like. He knows bad stuff is going to happen. And he knows... But this is particularly true if you choose to follow Jesus. If you choose to follow Jesus, you may well suffer for it. Paul knows this. He has no expectation of a rosy, comfortable, easygoing life. And in fact, Paul would probably say if you have a rosy, comfortable, easygoing life, then maybe you're not following Jesus close enough. But Paul is also not a sad worn out pessimist his perspective is fundamentally built on hope hope that Jesus has conquered sin hope that Jesus has conquered death hope that the good news of the gospel the kingdom of God is slowly and steadily and inevitably advancing hope that the body of Christ the community faith the believers who follow Jesus will continue to stand firm and strive side by side despite suffering and because of this nothing that the world can throw at Paul will ultimately shake his hope that is the perspective of the gospel not naive optimism but not pessimistic fatalism either I mean, you could almost call it sort of hopeful realism. This is the perspective of the gospel. The perspective of a transformed life. That even in suffering, there is hope in the inevitable advancement of the good news of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm.